Great to be with you. This is Sanctity of Human Life Sunday, and so we're looking forward now to seeing just what it is that God wants to say to us through his word this morning. And so what I want to do now is, as I do on a yearly basis, to turn attention to a passage of scripture that deals with this subject. And so for today, what I'd like to do is to turn to the first book of the scriptures, the book of Genesis. And we're going to be looking today at Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, as well as verse 27. And then in the second chapter, beginning with verse 4 onwards to the end of the chapter, I want to explore this whole matter of God being the sovereign one, a God who is the designer and the God who stands behind his design and see how this relates to modern day life today. And so what I'd like to do is to read to you from chapter 1, verse 26 and 27, and then in chapter 2, beginning with verse 4, we'll take it down through verse 9 for a reading. And here in the first chapter, we're told that then God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let him have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image, and in the image of God he created him, male and female, he created them. Fast forward to verse 4. And these are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. In the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, when no bush of the field was yet in the land, and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up. For the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land. There was no man to work the ground. And a mist was going up from the land and was watering the whole face of the ground. And then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living creature. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden, in the east. And there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for the food. And the tree of life was in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And so this morning we're going to explore these verses together. We're going to see how this relates to the modern culture in which we live and see how we can relate these truths to the times that we face as we look together to our Lord now in prayer. So our Father, what we're asking is that in a very profound way, you speak to needs, you speak to hearts, for those that have been present in this building, for those that are processing via the live stream and will be continuously thinking things through in the weeks to come via YouTube. We're praying, Lord, that in a very unique way you meet us at our point of need. For the abortion-minded individual, would you bring clarity to thought and allow them, Father, to rethink assumptions ponder the significance of what's here and how it relates, and that the God of the universe cares, that the God of the universe sent one to this world within the womb of Mary in embryonic form, and that you love that person so much that Jesus took adulthood and made his way to the cross where he would die in our place for our sins. We're thanking you, Father, for that fact. And we thank you, Father, that three days later, raising Jesus from the grave, the ultimate life statement was then provided for all of humanity. And so, Father, what we want to do now is to explore your word together. So we're asking in the moments to come, warm these hearts, engage these minds, shape these wills, 
As again, our Father, we've come here to see Jesus and, and Him only. We pray these things again now in Jesus' name. Amen. As was my custom, uh, late Monday afternoon before board meetings on a Monday night, I sat down with my secretary, June, and June and I began to go over my counseling schedule for Wednesday. Tuesdays are typically my day off. And as I made my way hour by hour and hour onwards into the evening hours, there were certain names that were not, um, I was not aware of, one in particular. And so I said, June, do you know anything about the reason for this person's appointment? And June paused. And June knows everybody. She's with Jesus now. Uh, she had been granted awards by the governor of the state of Pennsylvania for her humanitarian work. And so she had involvement in a wide range of people's lives. And she said, well, Gary, uh, this woman who's made an appointment listens to you on radio, as she and her brother and their extended family. And I said, okay, um, what do I need to know about her particular situation? She's expectant, if, yes, with what you would call with child. Her boyfriend wants her to have an abortion because the ultrasound does not look promising. Her brother who listens with her is a priest. And her brother recommend you that uh, she come to see you. And I said, June, would you go get me a cup of black coffee, please? She smiled and she said, uh, Gary, uh, she was an art history major, extraordinarily intelligent, and needs to think some things through. The ultrasound didn't look promising. The boyfriend wants the abortion. I said, June, set some extra time aside. We're going to have to think things through together. And so she did. When Izzy, who we'll go by her nickname, sat down with me, I watched her eyes very carefully. And you could see the consternation, the look on her face, the pressures that she was facing. And there was her brother, a priest. There was her nominal Catholicism that she brought into the office. There was the ultrasound imagery that was fresh in her mind. There was the issue of the quantity of life, quality of life dynamic. Pressure of a mother and to address this issue and provide life. Pressure from a boyfriend to take life. Pressure. Noting that she was Italian and knowing that she evidently had made numerous trips to Italy, knowing that she was an art history major, I let her unfold her story somewhat for me. And I was praying, Lord, give me an on-ramp, give me a means by which in the superhighway of conversations I can find a proper entry point and then move to the express lane conversationally where possible. Izzy, have you been to the Vatican? Her eyes got real big. They were watery, but she got real big. Yeah. Have you been to the Sistine Chapel? And she nodded her head, every chance I get. Well, no. I've got a book here I'm going to pull out for you. And you're the art history major. I'm not. I'm biochemistry. I'm med school. So you're going to have to teach me some things here. So I opened up to a section on the story of art. It's a large volume, pulled off my shelf. Opened up to the Sistine Chapel, and I said, read to me some of the words that are found on that page describing a particular picture, the creation of Adam. Adam's lying on the ground in all the vigor and beauty that befit the first man. From the other side, God the Father is approaching. He is wrapped in a wide and majestic mantle, suggesting the ease and speed by which he floats through the void. Paused. 
What do you see in the picture? What stands out to you, Izzy? She reads on. He stretches out his hand, not even touching Adam's finger. We almost see the first man waking as if from a profound sleep, gazing into the fathery face of his maker. It's one of the greatest miracles in all of art. What do you see there, Izzy, and how do you relate to it? God is reaching out, she said. Humanity is reaching out to God. But there is this little gap between God's finger and Adam's finger. Is that where you're at, Izzy? You feel like God's reaching out to you? You feel like you're reaching out to God, but there seems to be a gap between you and God, despite your religious upbringing? Yeah, she said. So what do you see in this picture? She says, I need something somehow to bridge the gap. Izzy, do you realize that when God created humanity, he did not need to physically touch Adam? Rather, he breathed into Adam the breath of life. And is he? He was made in the image of God. And is he? The child in your womb is an image bearer. Likewise, made in the image of God. But my, brother, my, my boyfriend, she said, just bear this in mind, I said. Put the pressures of life aside. What you're going to have to do is to distinguish between the source of life and the means of life. God is the source of life. The parents are the means of life. The parents are not the source. You're not the source. So what I want you now to do is to think about that picture that you and I have just explored together. And think about God, the creator, the maker of life. The God who has breathed life into your womb. You're an image bearer. So is the child within your womb. More to that story. But meanwhile, what I want to do with you at this moment is to look at three significant evidences of God's sovereignty when it comes to relating to the image bearers of this world, whether out of the womb or in the womb, and see how this relates to modern life. And the first flows out of verses 26 and 27 of the first chapter, as well as verse 4 through 9 of the second our Lord God's sovereignty is evident, first of all, in the creation of human life. So now we're going to pick it up in, in this first, first chapter. And notice very carefully with me that at this moment it does not say Lord God, it says God. Elohim is the Hebrew word. What I also want you to spot in this verse is that God said, let us make man in our image. Note the us, note the our. Where is this coming from? This is a precursor to a full understanding of the Trinitarian God. That there's more than one in the one. And so the image bearer is going to be bearing witness throughout life to the Trinitarian God of this universe who's the creator of all humanity. You continue reading. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness for reiteration, a restatement of the same theme. But now notice furthermore what he does for us at this point. All of a sudden, he captures our attention to environmental matters. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, 
and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Pause. I pull up to an intersection. Bumper sticker, car in front of me, reads, pro-environment, pro-abortion. And then my mind goes back, if you will, to something with regard to what Chuck Colson once wrote. What he wants to be able to capture for us is the descent of humanity, as Bronkowski would have put it. This individual was very much into uh, protecting the animals, but not necessarily the child. And he wrote, secular animal rights may sound appealing because it promises a naturalistic utopia, a future when we will live in harmony with nature, when the lion will lie down with the lamb. But this is a secular substitute for heaven, a secular second coming, not when Christ comes down to earth, but when humanity comes down to the level of the animal. Now, what fascinates me at this point is that throughout chapter 1, what you and I will find is a continual repetition of the phrase, according to its kind. For example, in verse 21, God created the great sea creatures, every living creature that moves with which the waters swarm, according to their kinds. And Every winged bird according to its kind. In verse 24, God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds. Verse 25, And God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds. Now, you have spotted the repetition. What I want you to see here is that there's a break in the action. For when God now addresses the issue of humanity, God does not use the phrase, according to their kind. Rather, it reads, so God created man in his own image. In other words, instead of the downward descent that our culture finds itself in, the antidote is for the pro-life movement to provide an upward ascent, take into account the dignity of humanity that is found in being an image-bearer made in the image of God. Thus, it's very important for us to be able to establish again an evolutionary-oriented culture that the Creator is the one that offers dignity to humanity, and we are made in His image. Thus, we are not made in the image of the parent. We are made in the image of God. We might have the resemblance with the DNA of the parents, but we are made in the image of God. Now, notice then how this is bookended in verse 26 and 27. So God created man, where? In his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female. Note now the distinctions of the sexes. Male and female, he created them. He bookends verse 27. And you say, say a little more about this whole matter of the image of God. Here. Well, you see, the image of God carried with it the idea that being in the, made in the image of God, though we're finite and he's infinite, though he's eternal and we're temporal, though he's unchangeable and we're changeable, we have in our finite, temporal, changeable state varying degrees of wisdom, justice, goodness, Truth, love, and the likes, in the way in which we relate to fellow humanity, affected, of course, by our fallen state. But we're image bearers nonetheless, broken image, but nonetheless image. On a wall near the main entrance to the Alamo in San Antonio, Texas, there's this portrait following inscription, you might remember it, James Butler Bonham, no picture of him exists. This portrait is of his nephew, Major James Bonham, deceased, who greatly resembled his uncle. He represents his uncle in this portrait. It is placed here by the family that people may know the appearance of the man who died for freedom. 
you then and I are representatives of the Trinitarian God in our fallen state, allowing for people to embrace the fact that God is the source of life and that we in turn are the chosen means that God has established for life to be brought into this world. This is the sort of thing that I was bringing up for Izzy as we had pondered verse 26 and 27. Has your brother, priest, been to the Vatican? Has he pondered these things with you? She said, well, we hold to traditional values. And I said, well, whose traditions? You're going to have to ask. You see, I'm more concerned with original values, Izzy, than traditional values. Traditions come. Traditions go. But when we're looking at the origins of life, we have to consider original values. And what God has done is that he has originated value in the life of the one that you are carrying right now within your womb. Now, she's in art history. I'm not. I was biochemistry in med. So what I did was I went to what I know something about, and I said, you know, Izzy, the average heart pumps about 1,000 gallons a day. 55 million gallons in a lifetime, enough to fill 13 super tankers, never sleeps, beating about 2.5 billion times lifetime. Lungs contain about 1,000 miles of capillaries. DNA contains about 2,000 genes per chromosome. 1.8 meters of DNA are folded into each cell. On and on I went. Do you capture here the essence of the complexity of life and the source of complexity in this fallen world is quietness. God's sovereign over biology, you know. She begins to, her tears begin to flow. You make your way into chapter 2 and onward into verse 4, where the first of ten times God speaks of the whole matter here of these are the generations. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. Notice the emphasis again, they were created. In the day that the Lord God, but now notice it's Lord God, it's Yahweh Elohim made the earth and the heavens. Now, I realize that those who are critics of the scriptures say, well, you have two divergent accounts of Genesis 1 and and, and Genesis 2. Not so fast, I say. For you see, these are really one and the same. There's continuity here. I ask, have you ever been to a play, a production? All the actors and actresses might be on the platform, and there are general lights available for everybody to be seen on the platform. That's Genesis 1. But in Genesis 2 you move to the spotlight. The other players, they are now darkened on the stage, but they are remaining on the stage. Meanwhile, the spotlight comes down upon what is critically important to communicate at this moment. Genesis 2 is God's spotlight, where he now develops in greater detail what Genesis 1 is all about where in verse 26 and 27 of the first chapter, you saw the zenith. You saw the pinnacle of creation, where one is not made according to their kind, but rather one is made in the image of God. So now, with a spotlight placed upon the image of God factor, God then begins to offer added color provide added detail to this whole matter of the creation of humanity, the one made, you see, in the image of God. Where in verse 5, when no bush of the field was yet in the land, and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up. Why? For the Lord God had yet For the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land, and there was no man to work the ground. And I know the critics again say, what about Genesis 1, verse 11? Let the earth sprout vegetation, 
plants yielding seed, fruit trees bearing fruit, which is their seed according to its kind on the earth, and it was so. But my response is that the Hebrew words being utilized here, sia and esh, carry with it the idea of not vegetable kingdom at this point. For you see, at this point, it's not necessary for man to till and tend the ground. And so God is superintending the ecological, the ecosystem to create a perfect environment for this one made in the image of God to function in, is he? You can be pro-life and pro-environment. God who created a perfect pro-environment setting in your womb for you to be pro-life and carry this child all nine months. And so there's this mist going up from the land. It was watering the whole face of the ground. And the Lord God, the Lord God in verse 7 at this point, formed the man of dust from the ground. Now, the Hebrew word for man is Adam. And so what we find is that Adam is formed from Adma, and so there's a play on words here. But what interests me at this point is that the Lord God formed the man of dust. And the Hebrew word for formed carries with it the idea of a potter. And the potter is very interested, you see, in working with his masterpiece. Catherine, I'm going to be teaching from Genesis 2. When I get to verse 7, the Hebrew word for formed offers the imagery of a potter. Question. Would you be okay with me using the illustration of you and Joe in your pottery class back in your childhood? And uh, would you uh, recount the specifics about that flying pottery? Uh, Dad, that's fine. It was essentially me meticulously sculpting the perfect bowl when Joey stuck his foot under the table on top of my foot, which was on the pedal to the potter's wheel, sending my bowl flying several feet across the room, mutilating my pottery for life. And I thought of original sin. And then he proceeded to inform me that he was stretching by extending his foot two to three feet under the table to strategically place it directly on top of my foot. Ah, oh, Catherine, you two are hilarious, was my response. But God, on the other hand here, is telling us that this is perfect formation. No dents. Rather, the potter is working with the pottery. The Lord God formed the man of dust, Adam from Adama, from the ground, and then get this. Now, we're dealing with the image of God at this moment. Breathed. Is he? Yeah, there's a little bit of space between Michelangelo's Adam and Michelangelo's God, but you see, the breath of God brings one together with the other. She's struggling at this point. You know, the ultrasound's not looking good. I was talking to my brother. It's possible that the little boy is Down syndrome. I sigh. Izzy, nobody's seen this, but in a drawer in my desk is a picture of my two sisters. One is a, a teacher, several master's degrees, and among other things, her specialty is working with special needs children. My other sister, down syndrome. They're standing together and you should see the glow on their faces. I love them. And God is he created both of them. 
Moses said to the Lord, O my Lord, I'm not eloquent either in the past or since you have spoken to your servant. I'm slow of speech and tongue. And then the Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth? Who makes him mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I? the Lord. You see, what we're dealing here with is the sanctity of life, which truly defines the quality of life. Now you read on at this point, the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living creature. Now, notice the wording here. It's Yahweh Elohim. The Lord God planted a garden in Eden. In other words, whether it be in the womb or out of the womb, there is the environment. God is the supreme environmentalist. Uh, a garden Eden in the east. And there he put the man whom he had formed. And then again, the Hebrew word for, for pottery. And out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. And the tree of life was in the midst of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. At this point then, what I want us to be able to see is the significance of what God has done. Lee Strobel and his outstanding work pertaining to the creation points out he, one who once an atheist, secularist, and now born again, trust in Jesus as Lord and Savior, writes, if I were to embrace Darwinism and its underlying premise of naturalism, I would then have to believe that nothing produces everything, non-life produces life, Randomness produces fine-tuning. Chaos produces information. Unconsciousness produces consciousness. And non-reason produces reason. And I thought about that when I was thinking about the various decisions post Roe v. Wade, such as the case that went before the Supreme Court of Casey versus Planned Parenthood, when Justice Kennedy, who is now retired, had in his response written, at the heart of liberty is the right to define one's own concept of existence, of meaning, of the universe, of the mystery of human life. Who has the ultimate say on the mystery of human life? Who defines it? Who explains it? It's behind the mystery of life. It's the meaning of life. And the meaning of life comes with the message of life, which is found in the 66 books of the Bible. And I ponder that as I look at the various cases that have gone before the Supreme Court. And what you and I have to bear in mind is that not everything which is legal is moral. And what legislators have got to grapple with is not the question of the imposition of morality, but whose morality is about to be imposed when legislative decisions are about to be made. And when one is grappling in this culture with the whole matter of what and whom is in the womb, we are not dealing with potential life. We're dealing with life with potential, you see. For you see, as Jesus was found within the womb of Mary, you and I are drawn to the whole matter of the description of what the writers offer, where in the Older Testament, the same Hebrew word yelled is used of children generally as well as of the child in the womb as in Exodus chapter 21, verse 22. Likewise, in the Newer Testament, the same Greek word brephos is used for the young Hebrew children slaughtered at Pharaoh's command in Acts 7, verse 19, as well as the unborn child, John the Baptist, in his mother's womb, 
in Luke 1, verse 41 and 44. So now what you and I have got to do at this point is to say, okay, God's pro-environment, pro-life. He puts Adam in this perfect environment, and he breathes in life. The, our so Lord God's sovereignty is evident then not only in the creation of human life that we've just noted, but second of all, in the establishment of human freedoms as seen in chapter 2, verse 10 through 16, where now we read, a river flowed out of Eden to water the garden. For the sake of time, simply note with me now that there are four rivers that are noted between verses 12 and 14. And when you get to verse 14, for the sake of time, the name of the third river is the Tigris, which flows east of Assyria. The fourth river is the Euphrates. In other words, the Tigris and Euphrates, which we still know of today, which seems to be a hotbed for all kinds of, of conflict in the Middle East, past, present, future, not far from where the Garden of Eden and the fall of humanity were to be found. Well, you're making your way through all of this now, and you're thinking about this, and now you're up to verse 15, and here you have once again Yahweh Elohim, the Lord God took the man. You see how God continues to take the initiative? whether it be in internal medicine, whether it be in obstetrics, whether it be in the environment, ecologically. The Lord God took the man, put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. In other words, there is a work ethic that is being established prior to the fall. Work is not a curse. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden, Notice the wide range of liberty here, freedoms here. We are in a culture that loves its freedoms and loves its choices. Vast freedoms. One restriction. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. In other words, he wants Adam to understand this objectively without needing to understand it experientially, you see. Which is critically important in this highly experiential culture. When the evil one was tempting Eve, rather than allowing her to focus upon the wide range of options and the great freedom she had, he narrowed her focus upon the one thing that she could not have and fixated it. And the challenge is, is that in such an option-based, choice-based culture, there seems to be a fixation that needs to be addressed here. How do we address it? In that outstanding book that Dr. Nigel Cameron has written called The New Medicine, former professor of mine, he writes, the most fascinating recent comment on the Hippocratic Oath is one that originated with Margaret Mead, the great anthropologist. Her major insight was that the Hippocratic Oath marked one of the great turning points in history. For the first time in our tradition, there was a complete separation between killing and curing. Throughout the primitive world, the doctor and the sorcerer, or witch doctor, tended to be the same person. He, with the power to kill, had the power to cure. He who had the power to cure would necessarily also be able to kill. But, with the Hippocratic Oath, the distinction was made. One profession would be dedicated completely to life under all circumstances, regardless of rank, age, intellect. The life of a slave, the life of an emperor, the life of a foreign man, the life of an unborn child. But society always is attempting to make the physician into a killer to kill the defective child at birth, to leave the sleeping pills beside the bed of the cancer patient. And then Susan Shelley, a nurse, comes along. 
And she writes, I was thrilled when I was told by my physician that our baby-to-be was a boy. And I decided to keep the news a secret because I wanted to see Marshall, my husband's face, when our son was delivered. In the fifth month, our doctor recommended a level two ultrasound. As I lay on the examining table, Dr. Silver manipulated the ultrasound, measuring the cranium, the femur, viewing the internal organs, and we watched the embryonic motions. Is everything okay? Let me complete the exam, and I'll give you a full report, he said. I hoped his evasive answer was merely standard procedure. Moments later, Dr. Silver announced his observations in a matter-of-fact voice. We have some problems. The fetus has a malformed heart. The aorta is attached incorrectly. There are missing portions of the cerebellum, club foot, cleft palate, cleft lip, spina bifida perhaps? Whatever, this condition is incompatible with life. Susan Shelley writes, neither Marshall nor I could say anything, and so Dr. Silver continued. It is likely the fetus will spontaneously miscarry. If the child is born, this is so culture, calling fetus on one hand, child the next. If the child is born, it, it, back to it, will not survive long outside the womb, you need to decide if you want to try to carry um, him to term. We both knew what he was asking. I was shaken by the news, but I knew clearly what I was to do and what I was to say. God is the giver and the taker of life. If the only opportunity I have to know this child is in my womb, I don't want to cut that time short. If the only world he is to know is the womb, I want that environment to be as safe as I can make it. She understood that when God established human freedoms, there are restrictions, and that she was carrying an image bearer in her womb. Izzy, do you grasp this? Thirdly, I want you to notice with me the distinctions of human sexuality. You're down to verse 18, where the Lord God said, it's not good for the man that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Mark that. Now out of the ground, the Lord God had formed every beast of the field, every bird of the heavens, and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. But notice there's nothing here according to its kind, according to its kind. In other words, what he's now giving is an environmental 101 course on being able to show there's nothing that pertains to the image of God in your education in biology at this point. Except you, Adam. And so... The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. Hebrew word, Eza, it carries with the idea of correspondence to, anatomically, relationally, image of God-wise, distinctions of human Sexuality. Now, in the film Rocky, Sylvester Stallone is falling in love with Adrian. And Adrian's sister doesn't get it. What's the attraction? I don't see it. Do you remember Rocky's answer? Well, Rocky said, I don't know. Fills gaps, I guess. I can almost hear Silver Stallone. Sylvester Stallone right now, I just can't quite get the accent. What gaps? She's got gaps. I got gaps. Together. We fill gaps. 
there's gaps in this culture. And what God does, he fills gaps by utilizing in a binary approach, not trans approach, two sexes, male and female. So the anesthesiologist in God kicks in. The Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, one of his ribs took one of his ribs, closed up its place with flesh, and the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he, God, made into a woman. Notice that the M-A-N is found in the W-O-M-A-N, but both are found in the Adam, which is part of the Adama of the culture in which God is working within, brought her to the man. In other words, God is saying, look what I've just done. I feel gaps. And then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. In other words, he's saying, I now get it. God, Lord God, produces correspondence. This is very binary. And it fills gaps. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. And thus the rest of the story. And that describes what unfolds here in their relationship. And so I read that. And I reflect upon a culture that is divided. Space. Social distancing. Gaps. And I think about that scene in the Sistine Chapel. Been there and pondered as you look upward, not downward upward at the sovereign God extending outwardly as humanity is extending toward God but there's a gap but God can fill in the gap with the breath the breath of life Adam you've been made in the image of God you know is he you're bearing one who bears the image of God If I remember right, when she got up to leave, she she stood there at the door, and my secretary, June, was standing with her, arms around Izzy, because June knew Izzy. Izzy, say hi to your brother for me. Love to be able to spend time talking with him. I know he's a very pro-life person. And... um, by the way, is he your, your brother, if he, as a priest, probably knows Latin. And the image of God in Latin is the imago, ge, imago Dei. And she smiled and looked at you and she said, I think I'll name him Imago. Let's stand together. This is a culture of gaps. If only those who reach could touch. And then you send Jesus into this world. Embryonic. Within the womb of Mary. Brings the ultimate form of life to us. Experiencing death for himself. No sin found in him, our sins placed upon him. He died in our place. He died so we could live. We see the imago. We see life. We praise God for the fact that you sent one to offer us the ultimate form of life, eternal life. It's in Jesus alone. And for this we give you all the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.